Hello, I'm Rich Folly, and you're at BookCon 2015. This is day two, and you're on the BookView Now set at pbs.org, and we're kicking off the day right now with Ben Hatke, our guest host for the hour. Ben, first of all, so cool to have you here. Thanks for being it. So cool to be here. Yeah. A guest host. You're with you're with us for the hour. Did you know when you came in you're going to get thrown into the uh, the mix of our guest hosting duties? I, I found I felt like I found out a little late. Yeah. <laughs> My uh, publicist emailed me and she said, "Oh, by the way, after we've been made the schedule, uh, would you would you like to guest host for a couple of segments?" And um, and I said, "Sure." Yeah. And uh, it's been fun so far. Well, we have a fun hour plan with you. Yeah. But let's talk about your book here first. The, your new book is Little Robot. Yeah. Uh, beautiful book about a robot that sort of lost off the side of a truck and is found by a friend, a new friend, a non-robot friend. Yep. Tell us a little bit first about how that came. You're Zeta the Space Girl. We're going to talk about some of your other stuff that everyone knows you about, but this new book is getting sure. a lot of attention. Yeah, well, I, um, I started with the Zeta books. They were the, these big kind of sprawling space adventures. This is uh, more of a uh, set on Earth, kind of a love note to summer. Um, and it's also about, it, it, instead of being a big sprawling adventure, it's very much focused on friendship, um, two characters navigating their first friendship. Um, but Little Robot, this, the robot character himself came from me while I was working on these big sprawling adventures, while I was working on a picture book. In the meantime, I had gone back to something I'd loved as a, as a, as a young child, which is comic strips. I, I grew up liking, or really connecting with newspaper comics, right? And so one day, for no reason in particular, I drew a five-panel strip about this little robot. Uh, no words, totally silent. Uh, he's walking along, and it's, it was a strip really about how I felt that day. There's a the first panel, we have a robot, he's walking along, and then something, ping, falls off the back of him. And he turns and he looks, it's a, and it's one little nut, one little screw. And he, he looks at it, and it's on the ground, and he reaches down to pick it up, and he just, he falls apart. Like every, it was like the one thing that was holding everything together, and he just falls <laughs> apart. Um, and I thought that was fun, and just completely unconsciously, uh, not with no plan in mind, I kept making these little robot comic strips. And um, they were very much just little examinations, each one was an idea. Uh, and the robot developed a personality. And I find that this is great, working with characters um, in a uh, in a not very intense way, just playing with characters for a long time. Were you publishing them anywhere, or were you doing just anything Just online, with them? it was just okay. for fun. Yeah. And, and it was like, I, and sometimes the best projects come from the sense of play, yeah. right? Um, and, and, and it allows you, when you're playing, it allows you to develop something slowly with no, uh, with no like uh, obligations kind of crushing on you with the, for this specific right. character. Um, you know, meanwhile, I've got my obligations with Zeta and, and ending this trilogy. So the robot was kind of me letting off steam. And then the robot started whispering, I have this story of my own to tell. And, uh, and it became this book, which is about a little robot and a very young girl, and they're both kind of navigating their first friendship, which is with each other. She finds this robot in the, uh, in the river, down by this river, in a soggy cardboard box, and she opens it up, and he's not been activated yet. It's brand new. And she pushes this switch, and it starts to unfold, and uh, arms come out, and legs kind of fold out, and he's this robot, and she, she runs to hide. She doesn't know exactly what's going on, and, and the robot takes this one shuddering step and just falls over, and it can't get up, and it's it's just brand new. It's a new like clean slate of a mind, and so she gets she creeps towards it, and uh, she helps it up, and uh, she says that's it, one step at a time. And they take the first step together, and when she helps it take its first step, it's this moment where she becomes responsible for the robot, right? And uh, and that and, and and then their stories are bound together at, after that point, and she. Uh, and so it examine, and so it, their relationship starts as very much like uh, the robot doesn't know anything, so it's a little bit parent-child type of relationship. But the robot starts to learn quickly, and they become equals. And then it's about that, you know, the, the the emotional, the internal and external things that pull apart a first friendship like that over much, the course of this summer. How much of those early panels that you were drawing, those early five-panel comics? Of that personality was developed then how much of that is in this book now and did it, and, or did it sort of arrive to you sort of fully formed or was it really sort of developing as you went um, it was really it was a long process I feel like the the most thi the the thing that I took away most from the those early comic strips was just the sense of how the robot moved his gesture he, he's a little bit of a nervous creature in his in his way so he's like his expressions the way he moves the way he acts you know it's like short, shooting a short film with an actor 
and, and noticing what their strengths and weaknesses are, yeah. and then being like, okay, I, I know you as a director now, let's do a feature length uh, project. Um, the other thing that was uh, special about this book was um, after the Zeta books, I had done a picture book called Julia's House for Lost Creatures, which was a bit of a different um, format for me. And uh, um, I took some of the things I learned from there and applied it to Little Robot, particularly like um, connecting it visually to Zeta. Is a, the, the Zeta books that I started out with are space adventures. Right. So a lot of the locations. A lot of are, action. A lot of, a lot of action. And a lot of the locations that we see are very, very much far flung uh, from my imagination, right? Um, this is set really is set in my own area, the Shenandoah Valley where I live. So um, for this book, I, I spent a lot of time going out on walks and sketching locations from life. There's an old railroad bridge yeah. where we splash around in the creek. There's uh, an old like 1960s Jeep that I found just like in, um, at the edge of somebody's property. And I, I looked at it and, and had a little face of its own. And I looked at it and I said, that will probably find a way into this book. So I sat right there in the road and sketched it. it. And that actually, that panel in particular, I just scanned straight out of my sketchbook, made a few digital changes, and, and it's right there as, as I first That sort of wide openness to anything that might sort of catch your fancy and that makes its way into the book, that's sort of another way of thinking. That's sort of an openness to everything around you. Did you think when you were going on those walks that you were looking for inspiration for a Little Robot? Yeah, very much. Um, and that's, in, in the early phases of a story, I think that's very important. Um, a project like this, um, a lot of the, pro actually all the projects that I've worked on to date have been um, different combinations of words and pictures, uh, visual storytelling and, and, and you know, uh, prose storytelling and the interplay between those two. Um, and in the early phases of these projects, I, I, uh, I, have, I have almost like two sides of a brain like working at the same time. One side would be um, <clears throat> plotting, and that's a text. That's purely me and the, in, in the, the uh, keyboard. And so I will really nail down the plot before I, and the, the sequence of events before I um, um, start on finished art. Uh, meanwhile, though, I have a sketchbook for every project. And that, the sketchbook is just pure freedom. Anything I, any weird idea I think of, because it doesn't necessarily have to go into the book or not. And it's developing a visual sense for the project. But um, so the goofiest stuff, I didn't know that that Jeep was going to make it into the narrative. Right. Um, but it was interesting to me at the time, and I just sat down and threw it in the sketchbook. So the sketchbook becomes very interesting um, on its own. And um, it's a little bit sad because then those, those, a lot of that material just sits, sits at home, and I think, what should I do with that? But, uh, you know, I share it with people. Online. It's still up there, it's waiting, it's, it's waiting there. to present yeah. itself. The friendship is beautiful in Little Robot, the friendship of the robot and the girl. Mm -hmm. um, where does your inspiration come from that girl? And I mean, do you have children of your own or, or do you have, you know, tell me like your, where you are in your own life in terms of relationships with those little. Yeah, I have a lot, I have um, a lot of uh, inspiration to draw from in that, in that vein. Um, we live, like, like I said, we live in the Shenandoah Valley in kind of this rambly farmhouse. Um, I have five daughters uh, of, of different ages. So I have a lot of, uh, Kids of different What's the ages. Age group? Uh, everything from uh, my my eldest is going on thirteen, and my youngest is uh, eight weeks. Yeah, that's weeks. a big that's a big family. It's a big spread, and yeah. that's a big family. Yeah. Um, but it means I have a lot of little um, little personalities and little models to, right. to pull from. Um, my one of my daughters was six while I was drawing this book, which is, and she's you know got a similar build to the little girl, so I had her pose for a few things. Yeah, I was like, here, squat down with this stick, and <laughs> let me just skip that really quick because I want to get that little kid squat just yeah. right. Uh, the same girl, Julia, she posed for a. I finished a goblin picture book, and there was one. There was one page of the goblin picture book was like, you've got to pose for the goblin too because the goblin's a little guy, and uh, and she was very patient. Right. Yeah. This is the part where the goblin's hiding under his bed, and she let me like pile mattresses and blankets and stuff on top of her. And she was very patient while I took some pictures. And very it's patient. Sketched. It sounds like a blast, actually. I'm sure she was. Yeah, I, I, she liked. Yeah, she, <laughs> she loved it. So. Pile stuff on top of a six-year-old. They're in good shape. Yeah. I think. yeah, yeah. So it's very different from from Zeta. It is. So you have this fan base that's kind of come along, and they've found that, and you're and you're you're managing that, and then you go in a slightly different direction. It's, it's fun as an artist to be able to play. Talk to me about the sort of different um, fan bases that you developed with some of your different work. Yeah, it seems like um, it seems like I'm all over the place right now in terms of age groups that I'm kind of writing mm, toward, or uh, or mm, I don't know. Uh, the the books would maybe be marketed toward. This is definitely a very uh, 
early reader. Uh, actually, I wrote it um, and drew it specifically so that you could uh, hopefully follow the the entire narrative uh, visually. Mm -hmm. And they uh, and so for a very early reader, they can pick up a 130 page little graphic novel and read the whole book. Yeah. Uh, yet the text will offer. It's not going to close them out. It's going to add like another layer to of richness, hopefully, to yeah. the story. Um, so there's that on the one end. Um, I'm doing picture books, which are for you know read aloud. Um, those are a, a blast to make. Um, I'm currently my current project is is another graphic novel series, a, a, um, a two book series. It's high adventure, but probably it's for older. It's knocking on the door of like YA. Excellent. And then I'm, after that is a prose. Pro's book. Uh, oh, wow. All right. Book. Well, you're, so I've got all kinds of things going we're on. We're just going to follow <laughs> along, but in the meantime, you're going to be with us for the for the rest of the hour. Yeah. Really great to have. We have Lev Grossman coming up. Um, we've got lots of great to stuff happening here. So we'll be back with you in just a minute. Okay. And look forward to staying. Stay with us when we come back. More of Ben Hackey, Lev Grossman. Uh, thanks so much for being at BookCon 2015. Lots more to happen today. Rich Folly of BookView Now and PBS.org, and we are at BookCon 2015 at the Javits Center in New York City. BookCon is the most spectacular gathering of passionate book readers in the country, focused a lot on the YA categories, graphic novels, comics, and books for young readers. It is an amazing group of passionate people all in one place with the authors who write the books that inspire this generation. We've got John Green, we've got Tony DiTerlizzi. We've got Jeff Smith who writes Bone. We've got Michelle Mead. We've got Jenny Han. We've got so many more running around this place, and so many of them are going to be coming right here to our set at BookView Now. At BookCon, readers come from all over the country to get close to the authors they love and to be around other readers who share the same passions they do. You'll never find people who love the books more than the people that are at BookCon, and you're going to see a lot of them today. I've heard some really interesting comments lately about reading and how many people are reading today and whether or not we're losing readers. Well, I have news. If you look around here, it'll be very clear. Your kids, parents, are reading way more than you are. They're attached to these series like John Green and Hollywood's noticed. If you look at the movies that are coming out now, there's so many movies, many of them that are here at BookCon, that are based on these incredibly popular books. Look at the social media followings of these authors. Hundreds of thousands in some cases, millions in some cases. Some of the most explosive energy in books and publishing today is coming from the categories that you'll see represented here at BookCon. So enjoy all the energy, enjoy all the passion. Take a look outside, see all the people that are running through this place, and have a great time with us here at Book View Now. All right, we're back live on the set of Book View Now at PBS.org. We're at BookCon 2015. It's day two. It's been a great conference so far, amazing passionate readers running all over the place. One of my favorite things about BookCon is uh, the fact that readers get to come in and meet all of you. Ben Hackey is with us for the full hour as our guest host today, and we now have Lev Grossman on the set. Lev is the author of The Magician's Land, as well as uh, other books in this series, but it's so cool to have you here. It's good to be here. Yeah, welcome. And uh, Ben, when, what I found out when I was talking to Ben, who I'm going to hand the book to, is that he's like, I've read all the books. And then I talk to you and you're like, I've read all of your books. And I think it's pretty amazing that you guys have uh, never met, though, from what I understand. Mm. This is our first meeting. <laughs> I feel like we're going to explode in like anti-matter and matter into a pot. Yeah, maybe, maybe just, this is dangerous. Yeah, uh, we won't touch. We'll just okay, sit here. That's good. The, the spark will ignite and everything will, uh, will fall in love. Um, no, I, no, it's funny that I'm meeting you for the first time uh, with cameras rolling. Um, but it's exciting also. Uh, I've been keeping up with The Magicians. Um, I think uh, my friend Gina gave me the, the first book, The Magicians, and I think you had me at Magic Missiles. Um, where, well, maybe earlier than that. That comes part way through the book. It's part way through, but, but um, you're drawing a lot. I, I'm just, I'm thrilled because you seem to be drawing s from such, so many of the same influences that, um, that uh, so many of the same things that I'm into. Mm. Um, 
And uh, I wonder, like, what what was your goal in all of this? Like, were you thinking, can I, how much can I jam in? How much of what I like can I jam into one book? Yeah, what Something like that? What, what was my goal? Yeah. What? I guess, um, you know, there's a sort of, I'm going to get myself in trouble by saying this. Um, I guess there's a sort of strain of fantasy, which is kind of, and which I love, but which is very sort of unselfconscious. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it, 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 the Harry Potter books, for example, uh, which I love, no one in the Harry Potter books reads novels. Uh, they, read, they read Tales of Beetle the Bard, but that's, right. that's the only fiction, as far as I know, that exists in the Ponderverse. Uh, one of the experiments of the magicians was, you know, what if we had the people who are going to magic school, they also have read fantasy novels. Mm -hmm. uh, and what if we try to sort of imbue fantasy with a little bit of the self-awareness? Uh, I mean, Watchmen was a really formative experience for me growing up, reading Watchmen. Um, uh, and that was a book where you, you knew that the author had, had, had read every superhero comic that there was right. and had very complicated, conflicting feelings about it. Right. Uh, I sort of felt the same way about fantasy. Uh, I wanted to write fantasy, but I also wanted it to be a little bit sort of self-aware. Um, and yeah, there are things in there like magic missiles for those who, uh, who have eyes to see. Sure. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of D&D in the books. I mostly, uh, people pick up on the J.K. Rowling allusions of C.S. Lewis. Right. There's at least as much Dungeons and Dragons in there, which yeah. was... So you, you did you play Dungeons and Dragons? Uh, I I still do. I still we still meet every week and, and uh, play D and D. So does that feed into your work? It is like, yeah, it does. Um, we do a little bit of experimental role playing to different genres, we're playing games, and the best is, it's like a, it's like a free form storytelling. So there's no pressure with it, and yeah. so um, my weekly role playing is is a very fun because I drive there and listen to music and then like like little story stuff happens mm -hmm. and then I get there and it's kind of free forms like or like unexpected things happen other people are in your story other players yeah are influencing that and if you don't want it to go that way too bad because you're playing <laughs> with other people um, so it, it's it's enriching it doesn't like I, I can't think of any one idea that's actually fed into um, right into a, a narrative but it's definitely enriching. But does the role playing in general, sort of just that whole idea of just kind of being in that group role playing environment, does that affect? Clearly, that's had some effect on what you've done in the magician. Do you still book. play anything? Uh, I haven't played for a while. Uh, I have played as an adult. I have trouble finding the games uh, yeah. uh, that have fit my schedule. Um, <laughs> no, I understand but, that. Uh, I mean, for me, a lot of it was just how they'd sat down and really worked out how a lot of this stuff worked. I mean, mm -hmm. Gandalf. I mean, he's doing magic. You know, he's doing it because they're telling you. But you don't really see how he's doing it. You know, does what sort of what what you know is is he talking? Is he moving his hands? Does he right. need a special herb or whatever? You know, how often can he do well, this? How, going on with yeah, Gandalf how long does it take him? Does he uh, mix these things? But the the, the Dungeons and Dragons guys, they had to work all that stuff out exactly. in a very literal way. So when I wanted to write a, a, a fantasy novel that I felt was like as realistic as I could possibly make it, mm -hmm. I kind of turned to Dungeons and Dragons because. They'd thought through all this stuff that, that nobody else had really worked out. Right. And those are, in, in the magician's books, I think that when they're working on very difficult, long, magical projects are some of the, my favorite parts of the books. Like the, some of the things that I appreciate the most is like, uh, I think there's a scene in the magician's land where they're working in an apartment. Right, yeah. And that whole process, I think, and whatever they're, the, the magical project that they're working on takes weeks yeah. and effort and all of this and trial and error and yeah. uh, and I really appreciated that uh, quite a lot and uh, as as they go you see different sides of the the magical world you see the underbelly you see uh, what happens when you're you're kind of out of the mainstream as a magician yeah um, and the world building that you did through the through the three books is uh, is has been really uh, interesting to me. And Sue, so can you talk about world building? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's just about, uh, readers have very high standards for world building these mm -hmm. days, I find. You know, Narnia, you could get away with, Lewis could get away with, Narnia doesn't have a working economy. You right. don't know very much about the right. ecology of Narnia. Um, but now readers are very aware of that stuff, and they want everything to work together and fit together. Uh, so world building is, 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 you know, you start with a few, few rules and then just try to work forward uh, and figure out what the logical implications of those rules are. So, for example, I felt as though if there are magicians at work uh, in the world among us, that the divide between magician and non-magician, which they will police aggressively, still 
maybe isn't as neat as they hope it is. Right. And there's some people floating around in that gray area between wizard and muggle uh, who are trying stuff and they don't know what they're doing, uh, but you know, they know magic is real, they sort of half figured it out. Um, just sort of exploring those little crevices um, is kind of fascinating to me. Yeah. Yeah. You, when you when when the first Magicians book came out, there was a lot of comparisons to Harry Potter. Obviously, yeah. Harry Potter for adults, we all heard it. Um, how do you think that the that book influenced your own writing of this? And did you think that that was sort of like, okay, I, there's an opening here for me to go do this? I've always been thinking about this, or did you think like that was just sort of bad timing that Harry Potter was happening at that same time? Well, it's, I mean, I had had the idea of writing a book set at a magic school um, in ninety. 96, I, I was a big fan of Le Guin's Earthsea books, which have this wonderful school for magic. Uh, and uh, it, it, you only send about a couple chapters there. But I always wanted the characters to go back, go back to the school, because I really liked that part. And yeah. I thought, what if you had a whole book that was set at a school for magic? Uh, and then Harry Potter came out, and I just was like, whoa, you know, let's, <laughs> let's put that aside. Um, and yet, you know, in mid 2000s, I just kept coming back to the fact that I was so attached to Harry Potter and that story, and also I was aware that my life was very different from Harry's, and I was dealing with very different problems with his, from his. I lived in America, which is very different, and almost as a thought experiment, I thought, well, what if you retell this story? The story of the education of a wizard, um, set it in America, um, age it up a bit so that all the stuff that, you know, that, that, that yeah, YA fantasy tends to leave out, like all the sex and the drugs and sort of depression and disappointment and stuff like that. What if we feed that back in and well, just... The Watchman effect. Makes, well, it's, it's very much the Watchman effect. Yeah. Can't overstate how, how much Watchman was a model for these yeah. books. Uh, I sort of tried, yeah, I was, what if you Watchmanized Harry Potter? Uh, that was the thought experiment. So it was, it was, I was very aware, and I owe a mass of that to J.K. Rowling. Yeah. Uh, some people make the mistake of thinking that I criticizing her or I, I don't like Harry Potter. I love Harry Potter. Right. I've been to many Harry Potter conventions. <laughs> I have a deep, deep affection for them. Uh, and yet, and when I tried to write something, you know, I had to figure out how to make it different. Yeah. We succeeded. So we, what, I, what I think about all the time when I think about these books is you go through, you have, your, your life is busy, as you mentioned. You have a tough time getting the Dungeons and Dragons meetings now. And yet this world is living in your head constantly as you're walking down the street or doing other jobs or writing other pieces. There's an enormous world in these three books. Yeah. How do you sort of separate that world that you've created from just walking, you know, going to do your other jobs that you have as a writer? Um, well, the, the separ there's a little bleed over uh, here and there. I mean, one of the great things, uh, the fun things about writing in the magician's world is that it's very close to our world. One of my rules for myself was that everything that exists in our world has to also exist in the magician's verse plus magic, except minus C.S. Lewis because that would just get too complicated. Uh, but everything else is there. Um, so probably more than other, uh, than some other fantasy writers, I get to draw on my daily experience all the time uh, for magician stuff. Uh, and it's funny because I, I have a whole other career as a journalist telling stories that are putatively non-fictional. Uh, and it's funny how much of the, st the storytelling techniques uh, are youth useful in both worlds. Really? That's really interesting. And you told me off, ca off camera that your daughter reads Ben's stuff. And Ben, I know you've been, I don't think your daughters are reading My kids aren't necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How old are your kids? Uh, the oldest is um, 12, going right. on 13, so a few years, a couple yeah, years. Yeah, my daughter's 11. Uh, she has read The Magicians <laughs> very much over my objections. Sure. Not a good idea. Yeah. Um, but when a child want, is desperate to read something and you have 50 copies of it in your house, it's and, when, and when Dad wrote the book, I mean, they, they want to check, right? I think they wonder what I'm up to sure, in that yeah. room all the time. Yeah. Really, at 11? I, I don't know if my kids were necessarily worried all that much about what I was doing, but I love the fact that she read it. What did she think? You know, it, she, she really loved it. I mean, she was really, it's, I think it's, 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 you couldn't have found a more receptive audience for my work than my daughter's. Because <laughs> uh, it's, you know, something now she gets to share with, uh, with her dad. It's dedicated to her. Um, uh, it's actually kind of a fun bond that we have, uh, and she likes talking animals, and I think sure. probably skips over a lot of the other stuff. Mm. I, I got her; she got into your stuff because I was so I, I so much wanted to get her into comics, right? And there wasn't I felt like that much that was in her wheelhouse in the comics world. Okay, but Zeta kind of struck a chord then. Yeah, That's very much. Um, I don't know if she'd read. 
comics, she had read comic strips, but never a whole graphic novel. Okay. Um, it was really immersive for her uh, in a way that, you know, only comics can be in a certain way. Uh, well, I hope my next couple ones, I hope I can get, that, get them out quickly enough for her to, to appreciate them. Um, I'm working on a series called Mighty Jack, mm -hmm. so it's a little bit it's a little bit aged up from Zeta. That's uh, good because so she I'm, also is aging. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Over I'm, I'm my objections, to, I'm going to try to draw quickly enough that she doesn't uh, age beyond it. Before Although you've out. also looped in my four-year-old and two-year-old with oh, Julia's well, House of Lost Creatures. Yeah, well, I'm no, I'm I'm definitely continuing the picture books. Yeah, good. Are you doing any more Julia books, or is that um, one off? Then uh, that's yeah, that's a, a talk that we're having. Yeah, uh, there's a, Julia might turn out to be a trilogy, um, and then there's a. The next one that comes out, the next picture book is about a goblin. So it's that's my D and D uh, story, right? Um, and it's definitely kind of a love note to that. And but from the goblin perspective, perspective. oh yeah, goblin yeah, synthetic. No, the, it's this little goblin, and he's in a dungeon, and then these terrible adventurers come, and like adventurers do. You don't think about the goblin; you just kill the goblins in the dungeon. Yeah. You don't care; they're <laughs> goblins. But this little goblin's just going about his day, and everybody just, just charges in. They steal everything from the dungeon. He only has one friend who is Skeleton, who lives mm. in the dungeon, and they play games together. Skeleton, he, just Skeleton used to be somebody, so Skeleton lets <laughs> Goblin try on his crown, and when Goblin comes out, he hides, and when he comes out, when the adventurers are gone, everything's gone, and they've taken Skeleton, and all he's got left is this crown. Uh. So he puts a crown on, and he goes out into the wide world to find Skeleton. Wow. Adventure. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to break in because we're going to break to our next segment, but I, I'm going to give you guys both time to talk because we're going to go to a segment that we shot yesterday uh, with Ben as host, with Jenny Holm, Jeff Smith, and Renee, or uh, I'm sorry, Rain, <laughs> Raina Telgemeier, I'll get that right. All amazing graphic novelists in their own right. That segment's coming up right now, and we'll give you guys some time to talk. But, Lev, thanks for being with us. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure, as yeah. always. Thank you, And, Ben, Lev. you're sticking around. Oh, so yeah. So we'll, we have more to come. Right. Thanks so much. Hello, hello. Um, uh, you guys all know me, but I'm, for the sake of everybody watching, I'm Ben Hatke. I make uh, picture books and comics, and uh, you guys do the same thing, as I well know. Um, do you guys want to um, tell me your names just for, for introductions really quick? Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm Jenny Holm, and I do uh, the Baby Mouse series with my brother Matt, and I also have a new book called Sunny Side Up. Which I just uh, took my first look at yesterday, and it looks is uh, coming out from Scholastic Graphics in August. So okay, I'll have a lot of questions about that. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> and uh, Raina. And I'm Raina Telgemeier. I am probably best known for the books Smile and Sisters. I also did a book called Drama, and the recent book that I'm here to talk about is the Babysitters Club graphic novels, which are being republished in color for the first time. Okay. They originally came out in black and white in 2006, and now oh, full color. Yeah. For some reason, I didn't realize that the originals were not in color. That's a surprise Hindsight. to me. I guess it's so. Fascinating. Uh, Jeff? And I'm Jeff Smith. I draw the comic book Bone, the series, and, um, and yeah, I'm, what I'm slogging is the 10 years ago, uh, graphics, Scholastic launched an imprint just for graphic novels with Bone. So they've done a 10th anniversary tribute edition. All right. Special edition of it. And I took a quick look at that, and like a lot of the tributes from other artists in the back are just uh, really cool and fantastic. I, well, a lot of like one of my artistic heroes are, are uh, doing, uh, have done me, pictures in the back. Yes, there's some of my favorite cartoons. In fact, my, one of my favorite ones is the one Raina did. Yes, it's a yes. really good one. I also liked Kate Beaton's. It was uh, that was pretty cool. It was they definitely went. her, but definitely. Uh, yeah, it was like that was like the she, best. She kind of got I've ever seen. Yeah. So Jenny, you're the you're the one who this is my first time meeting you, right now today. I know. Uh oh. <laughs> and um, I'm very familiar with Baby Mouse. Um, I think my kids are very familiar with Baby Mouse as well. I think we've got some of those floating around in our mass of comics at the house. Um, but Sunnyside Up is, I'm not positive, but is this like your first comic that is autobiographical? Yeah, so it's, it it's a little, yeah, so it's a departure for us. I mean, okay. mostly for my, so I do the writing and my younger brother Matt is the illustrator okay. and the creator. And, um, so this was new for us because he's used to drawing mice, and, uh, <laughs> and like, so this is real humans. people, humans. Yes. Uh -huh. What should we a new do? Challenge. Exactly. Um, but it's it's semi autobiographical. We grew up okay. in Pennsylvania and in the '70s, and okay. it takes place during the summer of '76. So, growing up outside of Valley Forge Park, 
<laughs> the bicentennial was huge. It was like this big thing. Like you couldn't get away from red, white, and blue, and yeah. the Liberty Bell. Yes, yes. It yeah, was I like ground that. zero for all of yeah. of all of that. And um, and it's about a girl who it, she actually spends part of the summer in Florida with her grandfather, who's at a retirement community. So, okay. And it's like a little bit of a love letter to growing up with comics. Right. And you say a girl is this girl. Jenny is her name in the narrative? No, it's okay. Sunny. Her name okay. is Sunny. So it's fictionalized. Okay, yeah. okay. And I saw, yeah, I saw in the middle of the book was a discussion about Batman and Superman and losing parents. Yes. Uh, and the, like, commonality of, of tragic origins. Yes, for, tragic like, origin characters. stories. I mean, I came from a big family. Okay. And I have four brothers, and I'm the only girl. I was the middle child. Okay. So I grew up reading all of my brother's comics. And so I, it was fun reading them and I was obsessed with graph, um, cartoon strips and comics but um, they all did have these tragic origin stories yeah. and I thought one thing that always struck me was that they were never able to save those closest to them even though they were heroes <laughs> right, you know? right 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 like, right across the board <laughs> yeah so. yeah no that seems we're actually over here l enjoying and laughing at your book <laughs> and right exactly yeah. so what's what's well this is a little segment where Sonny has uh, got a box of cereal, yeah. and you know she's really focused on the surprise big toy inside. It was like a big thing in the 70s. Yeah. Oh, that, that was, was like, I totally remember. Yeah. And then she actually pulled it out, and a pack of rally cigarettes comes out. <laughs> in other words, Dad was hiding them in the <laughs> Yes. <laughs> He's trying to quit smoking. What a surprise toy. Exactly. <laughs> That's great. Wow. So. <laughs> so it was kind of fun to like take a little trip down 70s memory lane. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Look at a lot of old photos to get back into the... We did, and we, you know what? We all had really bad haircuts in the yeah, 70s. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah. I still have a really bad haircut. <laughs> I grew up in the 80s, but I did. I wore those collared shirts with the, like, the big stripes across yeah, the front. Yeah, there's like. nothing embarrassing embarrassing about that. Oh. Uh, so, Raina, um, you have the Babysitter's Club coming back out now in color, mm -hmm. um, but this, the, you were working on the Babysitter's Club before you, were, before you did Smile, before you did some of the yes. um, autobiographical stuff? So in 2004 or so, um, Scholastic lured me in by saying, we're publishing Jeff Smith's Bone in oh. color, and we'd like to publish other comics. So at the time, they were looking for other people to work with. And at that point, I was making mini comics. I right. was doing black and white stuff. I was making some web comics. And uh, they asked me to pitch. And I pitched some of my original projects, but none of those things were really ready to go at the time. Okay. So David Saylor and I talked about the sorts of things I had liked to read as a kid. The Babysitter's Club came up in conversation. And they were like, you know, that's not a bad idea. Maybe we should do a graphic novel version of that. Okay. Um, and a couple of weeks later, I had a contract for my first published work. That's and so I, crazy. That is it is crazy. Cool. It's yeah. super crazy. A couple and, of weeks later. <laughs> and I mean, this guy was like my idol at the sure. time. And, no, not at the time. Still. Yeah. Still, to this day. <laughs> but um, to be published alongside Jeff was, was such an honor. And um, the books were in black and white because Bone used to be in black and white, actually. the You know, and I grew up yeah. on comic strips in the newspapers. and. I, I didn't think anything of making black and white comics. Um, and then a lot of things have happened since that first book was published in 2006, including Smile Sisters drama being published in full color. Yeah. And um, Scholastic decided, let's do a re-release. So can I ask you uh, this question about what is it like to kind of be looking, like having this back on in the, in the spotlight and looking at work that you did um, kind of at the beginning of of that part of your comics career like how's how's that it's kind of fun and kind of scary okay. because my style evolved so much right that's kind of where i was time. wondering yeah but i feel that my work had a looseness to it then that it mm. doesn't have anymore possibly okay. because i was i was only drawing for black and white i didn't need to connect lines sure. i didn't need to think of what the colorist was going to do sure. so um I don't know if you had something similar when you did the color version of Bone, if you had to strip out black spots The guy that or Steve Hamaker, who did the color for me, uh, was quite annoyed at how often I didn't connect the lines. <laughs> yes. He's like, can't you just connect the lines <laughs> once? No. It's just a different approach. It's yeah. a different approach to visuals. And um, 
I mean, I've learned a lot since then, but I also look back on work I did 10 years ago and go, gosh, I really... It holds up. It, I, it really does. Thank you. And, does. and I don't want to say that myself, not, but I'm, not, I, I'm not very proud it of it up. still. Yeah. And well, it very... makes sense for them to bring it back, too. It's like that uh, whole. Um... It's like the first couple of Beatles records didn't really take off right. until I Want to Hold Your Hand. You bet you they brought those other those first ones back. <laughs> You've been like queen of the New York Times bestsellers charge for what two years yeah, three years four, the top four, four slots, slots now you got the top four the top slots, four yeah. slots. Yeah. well when this book was you are the beatles you are yeah. comic but yeah, yeah half the I'm list Raina. was reina yeah, it was pretty exciting but the visual language was like was there like like the visual language the same visual language you're using in smile and drama um i was definitely there it's cool i enjoyed um seeing that so yeah <laughs> He's the bad boy that started this off. Yeah, no, like I, I feel the same <laughs> way that graphics. you do. Like where where it's um, uh, you're definitely inspirational. Yes, um, I am old. That is true. <laughs> no, you <laughs> are not. inspirational, and you're you're still doing um, new things. Like because Bone was was like ten years that Bone, you worked yeah, on it. It was twelve years, and um, twelve years. I tell the whole story. I yeah, my big idea was that I wanted to take traditional American cartoon characters like Big Nose, Three Fingers, Bigfoot, mm -hmm. and mix it with the kind of the grown-up fantasy comics that were coming out of France at the time, right. in heavy metal is how we see them. Uh, and I wanted to mix those up and tell um, an epic story with a beginning and a middle and an end, which was actually very radical at the time. Mm -hmm. There was nothing like that existed. And in fact, it was so radical that I had to keep it a secret for like the first five years or so because I didn't want anybody to know I was doing a big story because fantasy was really out of favor at the time and you know Tolkien hadn't made his resurgence and uh, and I didn't think anybody would buy it if they knew I was telling yeah. a big sword and sorcery type story so, yeah. I, so I just focused on the humor and kept you know cliffhangers and kept people coming back. Which is good because your comic timing is is perfect it's Thank so you. great <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the story, like the whole series, they drift, drift further into serious high fantasy as you guys. Right. Really something else. Um, so what's, what's um, the, the, you've got the tribute edition now. So the tribute edition is, uh, well, as I was doing the, the comics, you know, the black and white self-published comics, which was, it was all underground and all the underground comics were black and white back it was, then. Yeah, it was the cool stuff. Yeah, well, it was the cool stuff, and also we were all poor and couldn't afford color. <laughs> so, um, but like what Raina said, I was a huge fan of newspaper strips like yep. Pogo and Peanuts, and so I liked black and white. And Dick Tracy, Chester Gould used black so perfectly. So, um, but since it was one big story, it was very important that if, you know, I'm on issue 17, which is chapter 17 of this giant epic, I knew it was very important that people would be able to get the first 16 chapters very cheaply and very easily. Yeah. And comic book stores were not set up to do that in the 90s. They, um, graphic novels were just kind of a misunderstood deluxe item, or like a one-off that was not to be meant to be kept in print, except for Mouse and Dark Knight and Watchmen. But there was nothing else except those three. So, and they were expensive. So we, me and my other self-publishing cronies we decided to get on a campaign to um, do cheap, always available, always in print versions of graphic novels. And I had to, I had to have, bone number one was worth 300 bucks in the early days in the wow. collector's markets. Yeah. Whoa. Well, if I wanted somebody, if I wanted somebody to read chapter one, they had to pay $300. Yeah. So we kind of came up with this cheap paperback, always available, always in print model. And that was, and we got a lot of flack for it, but that was the early days of the graphic novel. Did you invent the trade paperback? No, I did not invent <laughs> it. <laughs> but I was the one that kind of got all the flack and, and kind of got the retailers to actually accept it and to restock it. Restocking is not was not an idea in comic book stores. It, it, it didn't. They just sell. Is this too inside sell. baseball? Is no, this boring? is awesome. Actually, I love it. It is. <laughs> so they, their model was to sell. It, it, Spider Man was on the rack for four weeks. The new issue came out. That old issue came down, went into a long box, never to be seen again except by collectors. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was just the model. Um, they didn't sell them like, like music or even hardware, where if you sell out of an item, you restock it. Yeah. Right. So the idea that 
you could have um, a library of a high profit item that you could count on, reliably restock it. That was an extremely difficult concept for us to push through, and we got a lot of pushback from retailers and from like Wizard right. and magazines at the time, whose whole goal was to say back issues are right. more valuable, more valuable. So you kind of pushed them into a bookstore model, basically. Yeah. We were pushing in a, them in, in, a, in a classic. Say this is a classic yeah. book that you always want to have, like, have on your shelf. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, but I feel like in comics, we're all now navigating the 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 comics direct market model and the and the bookstore model yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and we've all got like a foot in both those worlds yeah. and, uh, something to navigate so uh cool well um what else should we what else, what else should we talk about here <laughs> well let's talk about you ben you <laughs> Couch. You, let's, you, talk, let's talk about you. You've yeah, got a can brand we put new a book out. Spotlight on Little yeah. Robot. Yes, I, I, talk yeah, about Little Robot. I, it's so, a beautiful book, by the way. Yeah, this is between. Um, so I've done the three Zeta books. And Love Zeta in our house. Oh, good. We're big Zeta fans. Uh, um, but they're like big adventures. They're big space adventures. And then um, after the Zeta books, um, I did a picture book, Julia's House for Lost Creatures. And um, this is me kind of coming back to the graphic novel after having done this picture book, mm -hmm. um, kind of applying some of the things like artistically and story-wise that I had learned. But this also started as a comic strip. It was me going back to the newspaper strip. Mm -hmm. yeah. While I was working on Zeta and while I was working on Julia, I had started this just for no reason at all, just to play. I was doing a, a strip about a little robot, and, uh, and it just it grew into its own narrative, and it's really about this little girl and this robot and their like so cute. first experience of friendship which is with each other and, uh, and then the things that kind of tear apart that first friendship and um, yeah so that sounds good and it's a gorgeous book it's, oh, the pictures are really t double page spreads occasionally and yeah well I took my sketchbook out and uh, like I drew this one is instead of Zeta which is in space in the places that made up from my mind this is I am, I'm in the Shenandoah Valley, so I just set it right there, and I took my sketchbook out, and some of the things are just scanned right out of my sketchbook, oh, and nice. jiggled around a little bit digitally, but just straight out of my sketchbook, so it's very much there. I love yeah. the the loose, like she's so the loose her dancing. Yeah, like, yeah, and you give her like this little toddler body. body. How did you resist not saying little robot? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm a little guy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, I think we're running out of time, so... Excellent. This was awesome. Thank you, guys. This is great. Um, this was actually a really enjoyable experience to be able to, like, ask you guys questions on the couch here. So. Yay, BookCon. Yay, Yay BookCon. Book Yay, BookCon. <laughs>
to eat books. It happened quite by mistake one afternoon when he wasn't paying attention. He tried a single word just to test. Yes, he definitely liked them. Next, he tried a whole sentence. He still liked it, followed by the rest of the chapter. And by the end of the week, he had eaten a whole book. And by the end of the month, Henry could eat a whole book in one go. And he became known as the incredible book-eating boy. But here's the best part. And to show you this, I need to draw an anatomical diagram of inside Henry. So that's his brain cavity, and that's his brain. And then there's his stomach. So the more books that Henry was eating, there's a book, into the mouth it goes, all of the pages will go down into his belly to fill him up, and all of the information will go up into his brain, and he would get smarter. Henry loved being smart, and he thought if he kept going, he might even become the smartest person on earth. And he kept eating books, yet kept eating them any type of book at all. He wanted to know everything. He went from eating them one at a time to eating them three or four at a time, and he kept getting smarter and smarter and smarter. Until the day it all started going horribly wrong. To show you how it was going horribly wrong, I need to draw you another anatomical diagram. So that's inside Henry's head again. First of all, he realized that he was eating too many books. So his belly looks like that. <laughs> and all of the information in his head was getting mixed up, which looks like that. And it was coming out all over the place. Two plus two equals Poland. That <laughs> definitely was not right. Henry didn't feel so smart anymore at all. More than one person told him that he should not eat books anymore. So he sat sadly in his room for a long time, not entirely sure what to do. But then one day, and again, quite by accident, Henry picked up a half-eaten book from the floor. But instead of opening his mouth and shoving it in, Henry opened it up and began to read. And it was so good. Henry discovered that he loved reading. And now he reads all the time. He reckons that if he keeps going, he still might be able to become the smartest person on the earth. It just might take a little bit longer. Although, he did miss his old life on the road. So it wasn't very long before he took his tuxedo out of the cupboard, brought it to the dry cleaners, and resumed his persona, but this time as the incredible broccoli-eating boy. <laughs> the end. All right, we're back live. This is Rich Folly. I'm on the set of Book View Now at PBS.org. We're at BookCon 2015. I'm with Ben Hackey. He's been our guest host for this hour. Ben, I'm very excited about Little Robot, first of all, and it's been cool to have you here with us. Thanks, Rich. Yeah. We're going to go right now, though, to an interview we did at Book Expo America just a couple days ago with Gregory Maguire. Gregory Maguire, many people know from his famous retellings of The Wicked, our Wicked, which is a retelling of the Wicked Witch of the West from the Wizard of Oz series. His new book, though, is After Alice, which reimagines Lewis Carroll. It's a very fun interview with Gregory. Hope you enjoy it. Gregory McGuire, great to have you, first of all. PBS's Book View Now set, welcome. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Yeah, I love talking with you. The new book, After Alice, another in your incredible series of reimagined fairy tale. Well, tell us a little bit first about uh, how you got excited about Alice. Well, Alice in Wonderland is 150 years old this year. It was published in 1865, so it's an anniversary of sorts. 20 years ago, when Wicked came out, uh, my editor and my agent said, after its surprise success, said, oh, why don't you do Alice next? And I said, wait a minute, L. Frank Baum is, is a good writer and he's contributed to American culture, but Lewis Carroll is a genius. You know, I'm not going to rewrite Shakespeare. I'm not going to rewrite Emily Dickinson, and I'm not going to play with Lewis Carroll. He's too good. It's perfect. That's interesting that you felt intimidated by these people that you play with. I, I was deeply intimidated by oh. genius. I, I tend to be. But 20 years on, I've actually become more humble, if you can believe it. And uh, one of the things that's happened is that I, uh, I realized there's nothing I can do that could possibly erode the significance and the beauty and the comedy of Alice in Wonderland 
and through the looking glass. So why shouldn't I just have fun? Yeah. I'm old enough to have fun now. I've been well, in the you, business long enough. That's what you do. You have fun. And I mean, it your was books, fun. It clearly feels as if you, when you read your books that you're having fun as a writer. I mean, if, when you start to go through the story and think about you writing it, I can see you enjoying that process. I laugh out loud, and I always wrote for myself as a kid. I mean, when I was in fourth grade, I started writing because I was bored with life and I wanted to have fun. I, I, I was fairly restricted in childhood. I uh, couldn't go out much. So I had creative play therapy without knowing what it was called by writing when I was a kid. And I still enter my work zone with a spirit of play. Now, the interesting thing about After Alice is that as with a lot of books that I, that I do, if there's something about the original that still speaks to me in the way that, say, old music, the music of your teenage years still speaks to you even when you're 60 or 70 or 80, uh, what I do is I try to look at it and find a little strand of the author's original DNA, narrative material, that is available for me to tug at. And in this instance, Alice in Wonderland seems all alone in her adventures. But there are two things that we know about her from Lewis Carroll. One is that she has an older sister who is reading to her on the, on the riverbank, a boring book. And the second is, in chapter two, Alice thinks, I don't feel like myself, but if I'm not myself, who can I be? Well, I'm not Ada because Ada has ringlets and my hair goes straight. Well, here's Lewis Carroll's DNA secret message to Gregory Maguire 150 years later. He's saying, Alice has a friend and her name is Ada. So what is happening to Ada on the day that Alice disappears? And what is happening to her sister who loses track of the girl she's supposed to be babysitting? After Alice is how both of those characters go after Alice. One of them throughout Oxford looking for her and getting more and more distressed. The other, Ada, goes down the rabbit hole after Alice to see if she can find her. I love that. Fascinating that you feel that sort of communique from beyond from Lewis Carroll and you it's an obviously it's a homage but the fact that you think that hard about it is wonderful and you're, you're you're absolutely right rich in that it is an homage and that's what the title is meant to be too it's it's after Alice it's after the style of Alice it's right. published after Alice and the girls are going after Alice they're they're looking for her yeah. uh, I think homage is a, is a great word and when you think about fan fiction now. You, you do call yeah. it fan fiction, but not if you're getting paid for it. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> I'm very happy with Morrow and Harper you know, to, to actually right. sign me up for and, and pay me for having fun. Uh, but the interest, another interesting thing about this book is I never think of myself as doing pastiche stuff. But what I do try to do is to enter into the zone of my memory of childhood reading. And Alice in Wonderland, I don't know. Actually, let me ask you. Did you read Alice when you were a kid? No, never read it. I, in fact, I didn't become familiar with Alice until I saw the Disney movie and then went back and read Alice. Well, I don't, I don't know then if my question is going to be legitimate, but Alice in Wonderland is a kind of scary book. For people who were raised in the fantasy um, genre as I was in the, in the 60s, who had Narnia to go to and Middle Earth and even Earthsea and, and Neverland, and Oz. All of which I read and loved. Wonderland was far more absurdist, far more yeah. Kafka-esque. It kept not adding up. And as a child reader, you read to add things up because you need to know the secrets of the world more than you knew before. Right. Af Alice in Wonderland does not give them to you. But you have to surrender yourself you to it. You surrender yourself to it. And that's scary for kids. Yeah. So I tried to actually plug into some of that subterranean terror Right. What if we do live in an absurdist universe? It feels like it to a kid, but what if you grow up as an adult and find, oh, that was true. Oh, Lewis Carroll was actually sending bulletins from the front. Adult <laughs> life is absurd. I love that. So when you d decide to dive in, obviously this one, you had to get over the hump and say, Lewis Carroll, genius or not, I'm coming. Absolutely. And that took some time, but there you are. That whole process, though, of embracing another fairy tale, I mean, there's a lot to choose from. Do you just sort of wonder, or where do, when do you, what does it come? How do you say, this is the one, I'm going there? Well, I, I actually resisted it for a long time uh, until the notion of the anniversary came up. <laughs> yeah. And then I thought, 
Well, it does, it does make sense. Maybe Lewis Carroll is, is talking to me. Uh, and then I began to realize that we, we were reaching the anniversary of Darwin, of, of the great uh, Oxford debate about evolution, which happened just a year or two before Alice in Wonderland was published, and I think may have had some impact on Lewis Carroll being able to think about talking animals and being able to think about Alice herself changing from one kind of creature to another. Do you remember the scene in Alice where the du they're at the Duchess's house and she's rocking the baby and then it turns into a pig yeah, and, it, and it runs away in the forest? Yeah. That, is like, that is like so scary. That's so de Chirico. That's so, <laughs> uh, that's so Salvador Dali. Exactly. It's so 20th century and surreal. And I wonder how much of that came from the notion of backwards evolution. Yeah thinking about evolution in the first place. I mean, Lewis Carroll was very smart. He was plugged in as an Oxford Don. He was plugged into what the, the leading crest edges of intellectual thought were. Yeah. And it happened right there in Oxford. How could you not slice the things together? I love that. What I love about the, also the other element of this is that you're, each of these artists that you're reimagining, that you're playing with, have their own style. You mentioned Salvador Dali. I mean, Lewis Carroll was who he is. Al Frank Baum was who he was. You sort of helicopter into their world and sort of take stock and set up camp and then start to play. But it's always within their pastiche, their world that you're playing within. Well, what I, what I really try to do is two things. I try not to write skits for Saturday Night Live or for the old Carol Burnett show. I mean, I right. try not to make fun of the original because the only reason I'm doing it is that I revere the original. It still speaks to me. As I said, my parents were strict. We actually didn't listen to pop music when I was a teenager. Uh -huh. So I can't go back to that and think, ah, oh, those are the palmy days. Yeah. What I did was go to the library and I read these things. Those are the things that evoke youth and, and the sudden revelation of meaning to me. Yeah. And that's why they still speak to me now that I'm you know, entering my seventh decade. Or is it my eighth decade? I'm not sure. Uh, we're settling. I, we're settling. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're settling for grace and wisdom. That's right. Um, but I do, I do think it's not, um, it's not making fun of it. And I'm always trying to honor the original and say, my book, After Alice, can stand side by side with Alice in Wonderland and never hector it or never try to steal its thunder, but live comfortably in its shadow as a, as a distant, decadent cousin. When you think about those other stories of yours, do you even notice anymore when you're driving around New York and you see the cab with the Wicked on top, or, and you see, I mean, <laughs> Wicked has become such a phenomenon that you began, it's grown into this thing of its own giant being, but do you even notice it anymore? I mean, it's a world that's like yours, but yet it's almost Well, I, I, not. I do notice it. I think of it as being a little bit like the Starship Enterprise, yeah. like if the Starship Enterprise where to you know slowly float over the Javits Center? Yeah. That would be like what Wicked sometimes does in yeah. my life. It just kind of floats over and it hovers, and I live in its green shadow. Uh, and some, in some ways, that's comfortable, and certainly it's given me a fan base. Uh, in other ways, I, yeah. I try to claw away from it. Now it's old enough, and I'm old enough that uh, I, I feel I can leave it behind and say, so long, fellas, yeah. you know, goodbye, ladies. It's, you know. it's, it lives on its own. It lives on its it own. It almost doesn't need you, even though you're the father. It doesn't need me. It's, yeah. it's self-funding, it's self-propelling, and it will go on long after I'm dead. And I'm glad to be out in, in the clear and murky light of New York City right. uh, talking about another magic land that in some ways is, is more 21st century than Oz could ever be. Uh, it's a wonderful world. After Alice is the book. So glad to have you here, Gregory. I can't wait for our readers to find this book. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank tonight. you, Rich. It's yeah. always a pleasure to it see you. It was great. Great to see you. All right, Rich Folly, I'm back on the set of Book View Now at PBS.org. We're with Ben Hackey. We're closing out our hour. Ben, right. first of all, thank you so much. Thank you. I had a great time doing this. This yeah, was a lot I did, of fun. I did too. And uh, for people who want to keep following you, you're at BenHackey.com. Yep, BenHackey.com. You little robot, the new book in September. September, right. And you've got another one coming up that I think Back is... to picture books after that with Nobody Likes a Goblin in the Spring. And then uh, right now I'm getting ready to... Uh, I've got a story that I'm working on right now, and I'm getting ready to do final art 
uh, 200 pages more of graphic novel. It's called Mighty Jack. It's called Mighty Jack. Yeah, and you're in that world right now. You're totally... That's exactly where my head is. I'm yeah. actually uh, trying to talk about Little Robot. It backtracks me to a different story world. Then I'm trying to be like, oh, yeah, that, there's this, there's that. Because right now, my, my, uh, all of my story brain is in this world of this, these kids who plant a garden and the seeds that come up, the plants that come up are not from this world. Yeah. So J Juggling all that must be really challenging, but you did tell me off camera that there's a little connection, there's a thread that runs through all of your stories and that the world and universe, they don't necessarily intersect, but they, they aren't far from one another. Yeah, and then, especially in Jack, we actually see like there's gonna be a cameo of some characters that we've seen in other books. Yeah. So um, they kind of exist in the same story universe. And Zeta too. And Zeta also, yeah. Oh, I love that. So yeah, it's cool. And yeah, it's I, funny to, to, to juggle all these stories and have them swirling around in your head. You yeah, for, for readers, it's the little Easter eggs that pop up here. And yeah, there. no, yeah. it's Easter eggs, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're really into that. Uh, yeah. Well, that's excellent. Well, listen, Ben, thank you so much for being here. I really enjoyed meeting you. I'm excited for Little Robot. Um, so come back to this one for a little bit as we go out. And I uh, can't wait for your readers to discover in September. And yeah, awesome to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks really. so much. Great times. Cool. Funding for Bookview Now is provided by the Wincote Foundation.